Hello and welcome to Banfield. Uh, it is the first Tuesday in November, election night in America, where there is no such thing as an off year. You know about the governor's races in Virginia and New Jersey. You probably know about the mayor's races in New York and Boston and Atlanta. But in Denver and in Austin and in Minneapolis, Cleveland and Albany tonight, police are watching vote totals right alongside the politicians and the voters. Because a year and a half after the death of George Floyd sent the whole country into upheaval, those cities put police, or should I say policing, on the ballot. Let me break it down a little. In Cleveland, where seven years ago this month, officers shot dead a 12-year-old boy who was playing with a toy gun, the voters could be about to make a wholesale change to the way cops do business. There's a board that's in place right now that doesn't have a whole lot of teeth, but what could replace it is a civilian panel that could veritably bring the hammer down. That said, the contest of the night, maybe of the decade, when it comes to police reform and the so-called defund the police movement, well, it is Minneapolis, site of George Floyd's death and the murder trial that convicted the officer who killed him. Yes, in Minneapolis, it's called Amendment 2. It would replace the city's police department with something called the Department of Public Safety. And it would include not just traditional first responders called peace officers, but also social workers, drug counselors, and therapists. And if it passes, you can bet your bottom dollar that other cities are going to try it. On the other hand, if it fails, you may never hear of it again. So no pressure, uh, Minneapolis voters. <laughs> News Nation's Kelsey Kernstein is there live tonight. I just wanted to check in with you. I know that we don't always hear everything right away on election night, but are we close to knowing something there, Kelsey? We're actually getting those results right now. 56% say no. That's according to the AP. So very interesting results just now coming in, Ashley. And uh, this has been one of the biggest turnouts that they've seen. It's a historical turnout. You know, at 12 p.m. today, they saw a 140% increase than the election back in 2017. So it, we've been waiting for these election results over the last hour. We thought it was going to take longer. But coming in right now, that question, too, is at 56% no, and I believe it was 43% yes. And the Associated Press uh, calling it, saying that this proposal is rejected. It's literally happening. I just got the note handed to me. Uh, it's official. Yes. Bye bye. It's not going to happen. But here's what's really interesting, Kelsey, and I would love to just sort of pick your brain on this one. Most people sort of think that it's really obvious, right? The Black Lives Matter movement folks and uh, the Democrats, they're behind these propositions. And then the, the police and the, and the conservatives, uh, they, they're like against it. And it's just really not that simple, is it? Well, Ashley, I mean, you can see by the election results, 56%, 43%. I mean, we've asked a lot of people on the streets, what did you vote? Kind of a question you're not supposed to ask, but I've been asking it. And people have said, look, we are against the police force. We think it's broken. We want to see change. But then on the other hand, I've seen people say, if we get rid of the police force, if we replace it, it's going to be the wild, wild west out here in Minneapolis. So we've seen both sides, a lot of people coming out. This polling place say they've seen a lot of new registered voters. So it's been a very wow. interesting turnout here. Okay, that's all. I always like to hear that. Uh, more registered voters, right? Because I'm an immigrant, so I'm one of those most pious voters who just doesn't miss a day. But I always like to hear that, that if there's something that gets more people out to the polls, that's, that's always there's a good byproduct. Okay, so here's my other question. It's sort of along the same lines. However, uh, Minneapolis is a pretty liberal city. It's run by Democrats. The, the mayor, uh, he's up for re-election today. Uh, he was against this proposition. Uh, the governor... Uh, that's a Democrat. And uh, the, the senator, Amy Klobuchar, she, she's a Democrat, too. And they all were against it. So uh, how on earth did this thing even see the light of day if all those Democrat leaders just weren't into it in the first place? 
or really what this group did. They got 20,000 signatures to get it on the ballot. Really kind of fascinating. I mean, it all got started about 18 months ago when we saw the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. And it started with those protests here in Minneapolis and then across the nation. And this group essentially says, I spoke to them today. Yes, from Minneapolis. They said, we marched. We asked what people wanted. And what they wanted is a comprehensive approach to uh, a comprehensive de uh, uh, public safety department. They essentially said that we want, you know, things to look different. Um, and, and clearly what we're seeing is a 56% vote saying no, Ashley. So, Kelsey, so I like to look into uh, the background of all of the pictures that, that end up on my show. So I'm looking behind you, right? I'm always thinking, is there a story behind Kelsey? And the story that I'm seeing behind you is an empty sidewalk, a nice, quiet city. And I kind of wondered, has it been like that? Like, has anybody been out on the streets kind of yelling and screaming and saying this has to happen? Or has everybody kind of, I don't know, calmed down a lot and sort of forgotten about the passion over this issue? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, we've hear, we've heard people screaming, you know, what news channel are you? But what is behind me is this was a polling place that has now closed. We have seen lots of pollers come out, but I, I'm not hearing a lot of people screaming in the area. Before this election took place, I can tell you yesterday, a lot of screaming. We were out there by the memorial site of George Floyd and a lot of screaming in that area. We saw officers walking in that area and a lot of screaming towards those officers. So, you know, we've seen screaming, but right now things just seem to be pretty calm. You know, there's this pendulum, right, that, that often happens and people start settling in with how they view, you know, the, the month and the year past. So it's just fascinating to see how it's played out tonight. Kelsey Kernstein, great job out there and welcome to the network. It's nice to see you. Thank you. All right, Kelsey joining us live uh, from Minneapolis. And now I want to bring in a couple of seasoned veterans from the intersecting worlds of police and politics. Uh, Rodney Demery is a former homicide detective in Shreveport, Louisiana, and now the host of Murder Chose Me on Investigation Discovery. His mother, by the way, was murdered. So he has a very passionate connection to policing. Uh, Stephanie Rawlings Blake is a former mayor of Baltimore whose term included the 2015 death of Freddie Gray um, in that police wagon in Baltimore. And that was just a huge news story. It's, it, it's why you're famous, Stephanie, and it's why I call on you so often uh, when it comes to these issues, because I think you've just got a really good perspective. So, Stephanie, I'll start with you on this one as, as a mayor of a major city who has had to deal with policing issues. What do you make of what you're seeing tonight in Minneapolis, of that really big spread and, and the rejection of this, you know, defunding the police? And I don't think it was marketed that way, but, but effectively, this, this this movement didn't didn't get the wind it needed. It didn't get the wind it needed um, because, and, and first, thank you again for having me on because this is very important. Uh, and it's what I keep saying over and over again. Uh, when I went to community meetings as mayor, when I, when I went to those communities who were impacted by violence on a daily basis, they didn't want less police. They wanted better policing. And I think that the challenge is a lot of the uh, progressive movements uh, that are putting these ballot initiatives um, you know, on, you know, up for a vote across the country have an idea without a solution that people can believe in. Uh, and, and safety is too important uh, for a lot of these uh, communities to, you know, kind of go on a, a, a wing and a prayer and a, and a hope uh, that this vision of public safety will actually work for their communities. So, Rodney, I think, you know, um Mayor Rawlings Blake makes a really good point. I think it was President Obama who said, who the heck came up with that slogan, uh, defund the police? You know, that was the dumbest thing ever. Because a lot of people out there, they want to know they can call 911 if they're in trouble. So, so characterize this for me, where we are in at least Minneapolis tonight, and what this might actually do to the things that these folks actually want. Well, I think it kind of highlights the, the, the reality. And the reality is, is that in the heat of passion, we come up with all sorts of ideas and solutions. But after you know, cooler heads have prevailed, we realize just how important policing is. And um, tampering with such a system that takes care of everyone's public safety. I mean, the, the reality is whatever your ideology is, is kind of 
overshadowed or trumped by your personal safety. And I think once you start camping around the police department or, or painting all police officers with such a broad brush, it, it kind of creates problems. It doesn't surprise me that this measure didn't pass. Um, I don't look for it to pass. You know, clearly, there needs to be some form of police reform. We, you know, I think we've We've all realized that uh, I, I've been in law enforcement 31 years and I've seen the good and the bad. Um, but, you know, we got to keep in mind there is good. All right. Can the two of you hold on one second? We're doing a little bit of tap dancing because it is election night and uh, we got a couple races that are, you know, they're nail biters and, and the numbers are changing it itty bitty by bitty bitty. So stand by for one second. I'm going to come back to you guys in a moment. But some people are calling this thing a referendum on President Biden's presidency. Others are saying it is a Trump versus Biden 2.0 question. But however you look at it, where you're sitting right now, uh, the Virginia governor's race is easily the most watched race of the night, with 89% of the precincts reporting former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, a Democrat, he is trailing Republican Glenn Youngkin, 53 to 47. Joe Biden won that state, I should remind you, by 10 points in last year's presidential election. So a Republican win here would be a big deal. News Nation's Leland Vittert is live with me now from Washington, D.C. Okay, uh, like take me there. Uh, explain what's happening and, and the significance of this, Leland. Yeah, Ashley, this would be a 9.0 on the political Richter scale. If these numbers hold, it would be a 16-point swing in what was thought to be the reliably blue state of Virginia. Glenn Youngkin won, or I should say ran, he has not won yet, on the issue of education. That's the number one issue in the polls in this race. And education became a proxy for suburban, mostly white, wealthier suburbanites, all parents, to talk about critical race theory, mask mandates, teachers unions and their power in schools and also the transgender bathroom issue. And what we are seeing in Virginia right now is a big switch among suburban voters who were very dis distrusting and fa frankly found Donald Trump very distasteful and especially the way he governed very distasteful, who have now flipped back and switched. And these are pretty stunning numbers. Glenn Youngkin did not embrace President Trump at all. In fact, kept him at arm's length, almost the way you would a crazy uncle at a wedding or at Thanksgiving dinner, and instead wrapped himself in this movement talk about the movement of Virginia and making this all about Virginia. That has turned out enormous numbers in red counties, but it has also brought a number of suburban counties into play. We're seeing Glenn Youngkin beat uh, President Trump's numbers by 20 and 30 points in some counties. So this shifts the entire political landscape. I got a text from a, a, a lifelong Democrat who is a very uh, senior member of the party, held a number of elected offices. Uh, Dems imploding. It's the coming attractions for next year. This is just the trailer. McAuliffe didn't lose Virginia. AOC, Bernie, and the progressives lost it for him. And if you think about what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, all the folks who work in the Capitol behind me, moderate Democrats who thought they were in safe districts, places they won by five, ten points last year, are looking at these numbers and saying, I am no longer safe. It's a huge change, and it's very much like the change we're seeing, and you were just talking about, from defund the police in 2020 to now law and order in 2021. That's what we saw in Virginia playing out. Leland, super interesting. I, I want to talk to you more about it. I'm going to ask you to come back later in the show um, because I keep thinking, well, I was expecting to have some kind of an answer about the effect of Donald Trump on this, but I don't think I'm getting it because of that distance you're talking about. And I have breaking news as well. So Leland, stand by for a second. Uh, the numbers have been coming in. If you've been watching the largest city in the country, uh, the mayoral race in New York City has been closely watched. A lot of people kind of figured that Eric Adams was going to win it. But at the same time, Time, they're kind of wondering about Curtis Sliwa, the conservative, right? Because he wanted to hire 3,000 more NYPD officers. And, uh, you know, Eric Adams wanted to cut a lot of cops. And we just saw what happened in Minneapolis. But I got news for you, literally, uh, Eric Adams has won. So the Democrat uh, has won. That'll be the second African-American uh, mayor of New York City. Uh, he's a former police captain, too. That's also really interesting. Former police captain saying that he wants to cut the police budget. Super interesting. All right, so we're going to continue to watch the other races, but there you have it, New York City mayoral race. You do not have to wait for that one. Eric Adams has walked away with it. By the way, 
how much are you willing to pay to keep the police status quo where you are? Because there's a really good chance that your city has paid tens of millions of dollars just to make brutality cases sometimes go away. And listen, sometimes they should, and sometimes they should not. But in the end, guess who gets stuck with the tab? Yes, that's you. I am talking right to you. Welcome back. We are talking about one of the hottest races of this election night, and it is not for a governor's seat. It is the verdict by voters in Minneapolis not to replace the city's police department with something they were going to call a Department of Public Safety. My guests are former Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake and from the Investigation Discovery Series, Murder Chose Me, and before that, the Shreveport, Louisiana uh, Police Department, former homicide detective uh, Rodney uh, Demery. All right, you two, I'm glad to have you back because I still think this is such a critical story and we just had a couple of you know developments first and foremost stephanie i'd love to get your your comment about the uh the mayoral race in new york city where eric adams has pulled ahead and there's a guy who wants to cut the police you know i, I think the new york police budget is it's it is a different animal i mean their their budget is extraordinary uh and while a lot of it is in um in salary expenses, you know, to say cut po the police in New York is a lot different than to say it in a lot of the smaller cities that uh, are, would really, really suffer uh, if there were uh, cuts in uh, the police department. Uh, so while I think that he probably is um, banking on making some efficiencies, he also is clear uh, that he that he wants to partner with the police and with the community uh, to create uh, safe for neighborhoods all throughout uh, the five boroughs. Well, he is officially uh, the mayor elect at this point. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what uh, what the response is from those who are, you know, bitterly against it. Those who supported uh, Curtis Lewa, who wanted to, uh, you know, up the force by three thousand officers. So, so Rodney, um, there's been a lot of talk since the defund the police, you know, even entered our vernacular, and a lot of people have said. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, and yet that's hard to understand because, you know, policing is policing, and, and many departments, you know, gather for conferences to figure out what are you doing in your town? Let's, let's adopt that in our town. How much of this do you think is that the moment has slightly passed? New York aside, maybe the moment has passed uh, for the momentum of the defund the police movement, and how much of this is that, you know, violent crime is up uh, in most major cities across the country? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that the um, defund the police movement had any real legs to to, to begin with. Um, it, the, the notion just doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think it's a, a very passionate argument when you're when you're upset about something, but the reality of it is it doesn't work. As far as um, police and uh, you know the evolution of policing, it happens kind of organically. Um, you know, we saw a change after the watch riots. We saw a change after Rodney King and O.J. Simpson. Uh, police departments become more integrated with different types of people. They're more diverse. You know, you have, you know, minorities, you have gays, you have all sorts of people that are starting to come into the police departments across the country. So they naturally take that course. It's just a matter of how long and, and, and how long we're waiting for it to, to actually happen. I think in these cases that we've seen recently that have been more I guess politicized than anything else is that we have to realize that it's, the change is going to have to come, but not necessarily from the ground foot soldier, but from police administration. I think that's where the reformation needs to take place. So, okay, and I do want to just add, you know, before the break, I, I asked the audience, you know, how much are you prepared to pay for, you know, police misconduct? Because we looked up the stats for uh, Minnesota alone in 2020. Um, Minneapolis paid out, I think, more than $70 million, Mayor Rawlings-Blake, uh, to, to settle misconduct. But what was interesting about that was that the vast uh, majority of the, the, the misconduct complaints actually resulted in no internal discipline. And that's not to suggest that they swept it under the rug, but some of them actually just weren't misconduct. They just said, make these things go away. Um, this is an expensive problem. Cities have to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and, and rightly so, to be oh, honest. Oh, sorry. I was I Sorry, sorry, Rodney, I was going to get a last comment from, from Mayor Rawlings-Blake because I also have another update from Leland coming. Sorry about that. I should have been more clear. Mayor? They are expensive. 
These settlements are expensive. That's why it's so important to use them as learning experiences, as we did in Baltimore, to try to prevent the behavior that caused the settlements. And I think that when you do that, you know, that, that it does not have to be a recurring cost. Well, and boy, oh boy, the recurring costs at Minneapolis alone, like I said, 70 million, it's not uh, money to sneeze at. Um, to the two of you, thank you so much for joining me on this busy election night. I think that there's a lot of insight we can gain from these specific races for specific things. So thank you for your insight, and I hope to have you both back. Thank you. My pleasure. Going to scoot right back out to Washington, D.C., where my colleague Leland Vittert is braving the um, cool weather uh, on the Capitol and, uh, and looking at this amazing Virginia race as well. So, Leland, at last, uh, when I talked to you, was it 90 percent precincts reporting and Terry McAuliffe was at 47 percent, Glenn Youngkins, 52 percent for the governor's race. Uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot. We're at 48 instead and 52, but it's tight, but not as tight as people thought it was going to be. Well, exactly. But everybody thought it was going to be not tight on the other side. Joe Biden won the state by 10 points. A couple of months ago, you would have thought that Terry McAuliffe was going to win by a couple of touchdowns. And now we're talking effectively about how much is Glenn Youngkin going to win by. Uh, this is stunning in the way this has turned around, especially uh, in the past month or so, especially where uh, Glenn Youngkin was able to switch suburban voters. And you talked earlier in your program very rightly about how Terry McAuliffe, who's working the crowd after giving a short speech, he said there's still more vote to count, which is political code for I'm not quite ready to concede yet, but stay tuned uh, in how thin his crowd was uh, there. Very different crowd than Yunkin, who spells blood in the water. But you pointed out, uh, was this a referendum on Donald Trump or a referendum on Joe Biden? Terry McAuliffe tried to make this a referendum about Donald Trump. It just didn't seem to be working. Glenn Youngkin made it a referendum on progressive policies and on Donald and on Joe Biden. Uh, and even Terry McAuliffe had to admit uh, that Joe Biden's policies and poll numbers were really hurting him. And therein lies the rub, Ashley, that you figured out very early and very quickly that who defined the field of battle won, and Glenn Youngkin was able to define this uh, as the field of battle where vis-a-vis -vis, is this a referendum on Joe Biden if it stays a referendum on Joe Biden Glenn Youngkin wins if McAuliffe turns it into a referendum on Donald Trump and then with just eight nine percent of the le vote left uh, good luck but uh, then we would have a different answer so it's so funny as you were talking I think our viewers would be watching the video that we were running and think wait I'm confused there's Terry McAuliffe glad handing and laughing and smiling and it looked like he's a winner uh, instead the numbers are pretty clear right now with 91% reporting yeah. it's 52 to 48 for Glenn Youngkins but you know that's the that's what it looks like when you're still like I guess when you still have lots of hope <laughs> it certainly didn't look well, like a, a winner but you yeah, go ahead Leland real quick yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, they, they don't call him the Mac for nothing. Terry McAuliffe can glad, glad head anywhere. This picture really says everything. Uh, this, the crowd's thinning out. Uh, one of our reporters there, Kelly Meyer, said a note. Uh, a Terry McAuliffe guy just walked by with a full bottle of Captain Morgan headed for his hotel room. Uh, this is not the crowd, Ashley. You've covered a lot of political races. Th this is not the crowd of a, of a winning camp as you pan around. Yeah, I chose Boodle's Gin usually, and I loved covering this stuff. <laughs> For that very reason, I always liked it when it was over. Um, and I don't know what your selection is. Are you are you at liberty to say, Leland? <laughs> uh, well, there's going to be something when this night's over, uh, and then it's going to probably be a cup, a pot of coffee, because uh, we got to get up and do the morning show. Ah, but that's why you're paid the big bucks, Leland Vitter, and you're doing such a great job <laughs> at it. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Tell your cameraman, beautiful shot, too. You look lovely out there. All right, Leland Vitter reporting for us live. And then I'm going to touch base with you a little later on in the show as well. But I also have another story that we've been covering this for a while. And even though it's election night, I still think it's important uh, because law and justice don't take a break, right? But here's the weird part about this story. It's the royal way to have a stiff upper lip, but Prince Andrew may be breaking with royal tradition of keeping it zipped. Uh, and he's blasting his accuser, a then 17-year-old girl, who says his royal highness raped her. 
The rumors have been swirling for years that Prince Andrew may end up suffering the consequences of that chummy relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. But only in recent weeks have actual sex assault accusations, accusations become official on paper and in court. And now for the first time, the Duke of York is fighting back publicly. Gone is the quiet dignity of a royal. He's now rolling in the mud, slinging dirty accusations of his own against his then 17-year-old accuser. Joining us now is royal watcher Hillary Fordwich. Uh, Hillary, I did not expect a royal battle like this. I did not expect a strategy switch up. Uh, I just kind of think it's unbecoming of a royal and that the queen wouldn't like it. I thought you'd have great insight on this, though. Well, yes, pleasure to be back with you, Ashley. And um, you're right on the one count. Obviously, this is now really getting into it, into the muddy details. But obviously, it's not Prince Andrew actually doing it. This is his lawyers. Um, I think a couple of cautions here. First of all, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. We do know, and the world knows, that in the court of public opinion, he's already lost because of that absolutely ghastly interview with the BBC with Emily over a year ago. But what is interesting now in the court papers that are filed, two major directives and directions, and we can really see a framework sort of being established here for if you're, as you say, right, they might end up even going to court. Um, there's sort of a framework here for how they're trying to proceed. There are two main prongs. One is this, it's almost like, although I'm not a lawyer, it seems like it's almost like a motion to dismiss. They want to have this case thrown out by the Judge Kaplan in New York based on many factors, not the least of which is that Virginia Gouffre had settled previously with Jeffrey Epstein's estate, and they're hoping that that blanket agreement could cover Prince Andrew. And there's a lot more legalese in that segment of it with this whole sort of motion to want to dismiss the case. But the second part, Ashley, is actually very interesting and a lot of thing for, things for the public worldwide that we never really had heard before. There are a number of witnesses in this second part which is bringing to light and is basically obviously trying to defame her character, that's Virginia Gouffre, but a few things, mm. Ashley. For example, one of her former boyfriends, um, Philip Gouderon, I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly, correctly, but Philip Gouderon was a boyfriend of Virginia Gouffre and says that at any given time she, Virginia Gouffre, was trafficking nine or ten girls and taking them to Jeffrey Epstein. She was really a ringleader and in the thick of it, according to him at least. And, as he said, she never at any time seemed to appear like any kind of captive. Another witness is a Crystal, uh, and again, another name like Fig Figurolia. Uh, Rolia. Um, Crystal has stated that she is the sister of another one of Virginia Gouffre's boyfriends and that Virginia Gouffre actually approached her Crystal and asked her to find girls and help help Virginia Gouffre take girls to Jeffrey Epstein. So here she was as a ringleader and of course at the time taking all the money and if you recall her own father went on national news to declare how dreadful this was and of course it's ghastly this whole so everything that happened on that island everything that happened on the Lita Express everything is ghastly but wouldn't anybody be a bit suspicious if their teenage daughter was flying off and jetting around the world and coming home with all this money? Where was he then? So I think there's going to be a lot of evidence that comes forth from witnesses that will prove that she wasn't quite the victim, that she was rather a ringleader in this. That's what at least it sets out to do. So let me just ask you this quickly, Hillary. I've got about 30 seconds left, but I am really curious about the attorney that's representing uh, Prince Andrew, Andrew Brettler. He also is working with Army Hammer. And I mean, if you're yes. the queen, I'm sure you're thinking, are you kidding me? You really want to ally with a guy uh, who represents Army Hammer, who is like DMing on Instagram, I'm 100% a cannibal and I want to eat you. I mean, really ugly, ugly stuff, the Army Hammer headlines. And this is the lawyer now that uh, Prince Andrew's chosen. So again, 30 seconds, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, actually, no one can be in the mind of the Queen, but yes, I would say purportedly and allegedly, obviously, the Queen has been really stressed and really, it's so upsetting for everybody who views the Queen to be like the grandmother of everybody basically in the UK, and a lot of people have utmost respect for her, and yes, this has undermined everything she has laid out and tried to establish for the royal family the sense of dignity and leadership for a nation over the last 70 years. So this is stressful. It's mm -hmm. undermining to the entire royal brand.
Yeah, it's hard to be aligned with uh, cannibalism and sexy stuff like that. You know, <laughs> kind of gross. Hillary yes. Ford, which thank you so yes. much. So good to have you as always. Thank you for that. Love your perspective. I want to go back out to our own Leland Vitter, who is live in Washington, D.C. He's been covering the Virginia governor's race and, you know, uh, everything else because you've got a special coming up. Uh, you know, just add water. Boom. Leland's going to do an hour. So give me a quick update um, on the 91 precincts reporting and where we're at. We're basically at this political watershed moment that's very similar to what we saw in 2009, this rebuke of President Obama. Uh, happened in 2009. This is a rebuke of President Biden. Uh, President Biden won Virginia by 10 points. And a couple of months ago, this looked like a walk-off victory for Terry McAuliffe, a longtime Democratic operative, former governor of Virginia. And right now he's sitting four points down with 93% of the vote in. Uh, is it possible that McAuliffe wins this? Yes. It looks more sort of like an inside straight. And you can just see if we do a side by side of Yunkin's headquarters, which is fired up and ready to go. And at McAuliffe's headquarters, uh, it was never full and people are already hitting the doors. You got to look forward always, Ashley, for what this means. And it's a couple of things. It is really a rebuke of progressive policies. That's what we've seen in suburban and affluent counties around Washington, D.C. and Virginia. Places that went heavily for Trump are now coming back to Yunkin, as particularly over issues at the at school boards, transgender issues, critical race theory, and the like. It also proves there is this new path for a Republican paved by Glenn Youngkin, who did not embrace President Trump, but embraced the MAGA philosophy, if you will, and proved that there are voters in blue states and even conservative parts of blue states who will allow that? And that's something that certainly is a change. Uh, a number of Republicans privately are saying uh, that if these numbers hold and Yunkin wins without ever having mentioned the word Trump and without ever having done a rally with President Trump, uh, it might prove that the emperor of the Republican Party has no clothes. That is the most fascinating part of all of this. Again, 93 percent uh, uh, of the precincts reporting and the numbers haven't changed. It's still 48.52. So if he's, you know, if the governor's clinging to it with his fingernails, the, those fingernails are going to be hurting soon. OK, Leland, you've got a special, a full hour coming up. 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 Central. Leland Vitter is going to keep this race going and bring you all of the details and all the speeches and all the high fiving and all the sadness, too. And maybe a cocktail or two uh, spirited off to the hotel room. Thank you, Leland. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coffee pot's on. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.